Hey folks, welcome to another episode of Notes from the Field. Bob Ellis here, Program Director at the Natural History Institute here in Prescott, Arizona. And I just got a text. I got a text from our science director, Dr. Lisa Floyd Hanna, and she said, you got to see this. And uh, I texted her back, what do you mean? She said, and, and get, get somebody to bring some video because this is just what, what I'm seeing out here is natural selection in action. I said, well, tell me more, tell me more. And she said, no, just come on out here. You got to see it. So we're going to head up the trail, see if we can find her up there and see what she has to show us. Hey, hey, there she is. We finally found her. Hey, Lisa. Hey, Bob. We got your text and that you said that you had something that you wanted to show us. And by the way, this is Dr. Lisa Floyd Hanna. She's the science director at the Natural History Institute. And she has tremendous amount of experience and research background in both pinions and junipers, especially up on the Colorado Plateau, but also down here in the Mugian Highlands. And so I'm looking forward to what you have to show us. Okay, well, good to see you. And I wish I had some real happy news today, <laughs> but I'm gonna try to mix uh, some reality and some happy news. Okay, uh, fair enough. With our ecological description of this area. So we're sitting in the middle of the Prescott National Forest, an area called Thumb Butte, and it's an area that's kind of beloved by uh, lots of people in our community, and it's an area where lots of us hike daily. And I was hiking through here yesterday, and I was struck by a couple of things that have to do with climate change, I believe. And those are um, going to be visible from our area. We are going to see that we have pinions and junipers, which are species common to the southwest and some of the hardiest tree species that there are. Below these elevations, it's mostly a shrub kind of or a desert. So this is an area where pinions and junipers mix with other tree species and are very, very hardy. And so it became really startling to me when I came up the trail and maybe we could get a pan view of this area that I saw yesterday and I'm seeing again today. And that is showing that almost every other big juniper tree in here appears to be dying. And this juniper is called alligator juniper, Juniperus depiana. And it, like other junipers in the Southwest, has a pretty widespread distribution. But this one's a little different because it goes from here south. So we're sitting on the northern edge of the alligator juniper area. And we're seeing some stresses to these populations that are pretty startling because this might be even the wettest and uh, most rich kind of environment for this species. As you could see, each of these junipers, maybe we could see this one right here, or two or three, um, are losing their foliage. They're turning brown. They almost look like they've been in a fire, but they haven't. And this is actually becoming clear in other junipers as well. Just north of Prescott, Arizona, um, there's another juniper species where every other tree is dying. And we're seeing that throughout southeast Utah as well. But this species, we hadn't seen it yet. Mm. And so I really wanted to show you this, Bob, and say, wow, we got to start watching this um, and seeing uh, if this plays out throughout the rest of the summer. The other species that I wanted to focus on is the sister plant to juniper, and that is pinyon pine. Mm. So here in the Mogollon Highlands, we have a pinyon pine that's unique to our area. So let me just tell you a little bit about pinyon pines. They're my favorite plant on the entire planet. And they are short. You could see them across the way. They're short, maybe 30 feet max. They have their needles, like all pines do, in bundles, in fascicles. So we have one right here uh, that we can get a close-up look at. And this pinion in our area has been a taxonomic nightmare for mm -hmm. botanists forever because it has 
sometimes one and sometimes two needles in a bunch. Those bunches are called fascicles. This particular tree has mostly one single needle, but there are many of the trees in our area that has one and two. Whereas if you go up to the Mogollon Rim, say you're in Flagstaff and further north, almost all the pinions have two needles per fascicle. You go into the Great Basin, you get one needle per fascicle. And if you go down into Mexico, you get three and even four. So this funny pinion has both one and two. So over the years, taxonomists have placed this Mogollon Highlands pinion into the Colorado Plateau type and called it Pinus edulis variety phallix, and sometimes into the single needle type, Pinus monophylla variety phallix. But now with new evidence in its DNA, the DNA of the chloroplast and the DNA of the mitochondria, this is firmly um, denoted its own species. It is now uh. Pinus phallix. And we at the Natural History Institute are going to conform to that new name um, and give it its own specific status. So think about needles for a minute. They're long and thin. Well, these are kind of short and thin. But pinion needles are really unique kinds of structures that are adapted to drought. They have lines of stomata, and they have a certain number of resin ducts in them. So those are diagnostic kind of characteristics. This particular arrangement of needles, stomata, and resin ducts allows these plants to persist during May and June drought. That's kind of the key thing for these pinions is that the rest of the pinions live where there's maybe a big monsoon, but they do get some water in May and June, and maybe they'll get a lot of water in winter snow. Whereas this species can tolerate the kinds of conditions that are unique to the Mogollon Highlands, and that is super dry May and June, characteristically, before climate change. So now, uh, with climate change, we have uh, annual precipitation dropping low, but also, Bob, what's the other environmental characteristic that we have? Oh, increasingly hot. Yeah, increasingly hot. If you look at the temperatures in the Prescott area, the annual temperatures is going up, 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 up. And so that is a challenge to these species. But I'm really happy to report that pinions have been able to tolerate this. In fact, they haven't even succumbed to some of the insects that other pinions have. Uh, died from in the late in the late 90s and early 2000s. We lost probably 50% of the pinions all over the Colorado Plateau and much higher in some areas like Santa Fe where they lost 95%. So we've been so, really that lucky. Was, that, that was a to beetle kill, Ips? Yes. So the beetle that was that kills stressed trees is a native beetle. Um, it's Ips confusus and so far, though that beetle is here, these uh, trees have not succumbed to it in a, in a big way. So then back to our junipers. So they're accompanied by these junipers, and junipers also have a whole bunch of uh, native pathogens, but they don't seem to be what's killing these trees. And that's the thing that researchers are all focusing on right now, is like, what is killing them? Why should a drought-tolerant species suddenly be succumbing to drought like this. So if you can indulge me for just a minute, I want to talk about a little bit of uh, major science on this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are two different strategies with junipers and with pinions in the way they respond to temperature. So a pinion has its stomata, the holes in the leaves where CO2 comes in, oxygen goes out. They have those open until the soil moisture is too low or the air moisture is too low. And they realize, ooh, this is not good. So they shut those stomata. And that happens about 11 o'clock in the day sometimes, depending on the temperature. And it helps them react to the environment. And that's called isohydry. So they, they're clever. They go, uh, I don't care if I'm not going to grow, because for a plant to grow, you've got to have CO2 come in. 
Instead, they shut the stomach up. The junipers, on the other hand, seem to keep those stomata open. They don't respond to soil moisture and vapor pressure deficits in the atmosphere like pinions do. And so they're called anisohydrous. And that, those two strategies seem to work real well. In fact, people think junipers are tougher little beans because they grow faster. They get into new habitats. They get into burn habitats. They compete better because they keep their stomach open and they keep growing. Maybe it's, we're seeing that those two strategies um, are playing out here, that this may be the better strategy at this moment than uh, the junipers. So here we have a, a nice healthy alligator juniper. You can see its namesake for the alligator-like bark and lovely green foliage on this species. But right under it, you could see a pinion growing right through it. And that is a relationship that is seen all over the Southwest, that junipers of all species and pinion of all species tend to grow best when they're together. And of course, Native American populations have wonderful um, stories and reasons why this may occur. It could have to do with soil mycorrhizae. It could have to do with they're just the best nurse plants for each other, and they tend to, ha to occur in the same habitats. But they always will be together like this. Although juniper does tend to get to areas before pinion does, and the pinion seems to follow. Okay, let's go over here to this oak. I was noticing this too, Lisa, that there are oaks. Oh, just even driving into that parking lot, that whole dying hillside. Dying everywhere. Yeah. Wow. So, another piece uh, of this puzzle this year is a phenomenon of oak dieback. One of the things about our Mogollon Highlands is that we have many, many species of oak. And they come in from southern Arizona. And this is kind of their northern um, extent of their range, many of the species. And what you're seeing here is one of our scrub oaks, which is generally very, very resilient. and for example, if there was a fire here, it would burn and it would re-sprout within weeks of that fire. This phenomenon where they're retrenching, in other words, the leaves are dying and falling off, is not entirely uncommon. We see this other wow. uh, times, bad years, cold years with oaks, but the level to which this is happening is startling to me. Mm. And it's happening to lots of different species of oaks. So I think this is something we really need to keep our eye on, the fact that our hardiest shrubs and our hardiest trees are starting to succumb directly uh, to the changes in climate, the increasing heat and increasing temperature. So Lisa, I imagine the viewers of this video are wondering well, what can be done about this. Yeah, well, I don't think we can solve the climate change problem overnight. We can really help by monitoring these kinds of new phenomena. So at the Natural History Institute, what we're hoping that you'll do is as you're out on trails uh, in the area or wherever you live, this summer that you would be willing to take observations that would be really helpful and there are projects for example in southeastern utah um, and other areas where researchers are trying to get a broad uh, scope view of where the juniper death is occurring so they're using remote sense data um, and i think augmenting that with Field trips would be great. For example, I was just at Hoven Weep National Park a few weeks ago and was startled that every other Utah juniper was dead. Wow. 
So wherever you are, the information is going to be valuable. It's new kinds of observations. Don't feel like you have to be able to, you know, have a lot of detail, but just what you're seeing is going to be really valuable. We really appreciate you inviting us out and we appreciate you all watching these videos. Why don't you give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't, and any comments that you leave down below is always welcome. So thanks for viewing. See you next time. Thank you.